an army's logistics system has always been crucial to its success, and Alexander's army was no different. His great conquests would never have been possible without the skillful organization of his forces throughout his campaigns. So, in this episode, we shall cover the logistics of the Macedonian army. Our story starts with the logistics of the Greek armies of the Classical period. When fighting fellow city-states, the armies usually followed certain conventions. They would leave their home city and travel to an agreed battleground suitable for phalanx warfare. They would then engage their enemy in battle before returning home. The armies were not intended to stay out in the field for long durations. Thousands of non-combatants, attendants, women and slaves travelled with them, sometimes outnumbering the soldiers. That dramatically reduced the army's speed and mobility, and every follower meant an extra mouth to feed. Furthermore, the Greek armies used ox carts and wagons, and this inevitably impeded an army's speed and mobility further. The throat and girth harnesses severely damaged the animals, and rough terrain easily hindered the carts. This system was therefore designed only for short distances and slow movement. Philip realized that things needed to change, and made sweeping reforms to the Macedonian logistics system. He aimed to create a system that prioritized his army's sustainability, mobility and speed. Fortunately for him, Philip had a suitable precedent in the Greek commander Xenophon, who decided to burn his wagons to lighten the load of his army during the March of the 10,000 out of Asia some 50 years before. This greatly increased the speed and mobility of his force, and was crucial to the success of his march. Likely using Xenophon's success as a precedent, Philip forbade the use of ox carts and wagons in his army. Instead, he used horses as the prominent pack animal, the first time a western commander had done this. It soon provided dividends, as it gave his army more mobility. Philip also increased the amount of supplies carried by his men on campaign. This included arms and armour, possibly even the Sarissa, which could be detached into two sections to ease its portability. Each soldier would also have to carry rations, utensils, blankets, road-building tools, medical supplies, a 30-day supply of flour, and any personal possessions in a pack. Altogether, this would have weighed around 80 pounds. To further lighten his baggage train, the Macedonian king drastically reduced the number of non-combatants accompanying the army. Women were forbidden while the number of servants was drastically reduced. Each cavalryman would have one servant, while for the infantry there would be one servant for every ten Macedonians. These attendants would carry hand mills used for grinding grain, guy ropes for both bridge building and rock climbing, and their own bedding and rations. Not only was Philip's army now able to move quicker and inflict lightning strikes on opposing forces, but he could sustain his army in the field significantly longer than his mainland Greek counterparts. And so, just as with his infantry, cavalry and siege craft, Alexander inherited and made use of a logistics system that had been radically transformed into the most efficient of its time. In 335 BC, for instance, to crush a Theban revolt, his army marched from Lake Lycnetus to Boeotia some 500 miles in 13 days, catching the Theban rebels completely off guard. With his newly reformed logistics system supporting and supplying his army, in 334 BC, Alexander set forth for Asia. Yet fighting in Asia would prove very different from fighting in Europe. Alexander therefore soon adapted the logistic system he had inherited to suit his new theatres of war. One such area that gradually experienced improvement and alteration was the baggage train. Traversing the Persian Empire meant that Alexander needed to ensure his baggage train was well organised. Therefore a transport officer, a skoidos, was placed in overall charge of the baggage train. 
The Skoidos would manage the baggage train's defences, marching order, the welfare of the pack animals, and distribution of supplies. Parmenion likely filled this role until his execution in 330 BC. A critical factor for a successful baggage train was the welfare of the animals, and although troops or servants carried many items in Alexander's army, they could not carry critical equipment such as tents, firewood, loot, and perhaps each man's sarissa when they did not expect to be fighting. This made the beasts of burden essential. Horses and mules remained the predominant pack animals within Alexander's army. Yet he would also incorporate another animal to carry supplies, the camel. Introduced into Alexander's army in either Syria or Egypt, the camel played a critical role in Alexander's conquests. While the horse or mule carried 200 pounds of supplies over a long distance, camels were able to transport 300 pounds. They were also well suited for traversing arid terrain, having barely any limitations on what they could eat and drink if necessary. All that made them the ideal baggage animals for Alexander's marches into the Persian heartlands and beyond, lands where the need for speed across harsh deserts was critical. Throughout his campaigns, horses, mules and camels remained the engine of Alexander's Macedonian baggage train. Their speed and endurance were much greater than oxen, and this suited his desire for light, fast marches across harsh terrain. He would recruit these animals throughout his campaign. They were then spread throughout his army to supply the men, animals being attached to every decus unit. Yet Alexander could not maintain this highly mobile baggage train during the entirety of his campaign. At times, we hear of carts being temporarily reintroduced into Alexander's army, most notably in Iran. However, just as Xenophon had before him, he soon had most of them burned to avoid them hindering his army in harsh terrain. A few carts inevitably remained, and were tasked with transporting certain heavier essential items, most notably siege machinery and the wounded. Alexander would make one other critical change to the Macedonian baggage train. As he and his army marched further and further away from the Mediterranean, it became clear to Alexander's soldiers that it would be many years before they would see their wives and children again in Macedonia. Alexander therefore permitted women to travel with the baggage train again. Alexander even allowed his soldiers to marry captive women they would have children, and the baggage train swelled in size. Although a radical change from his father's logistics system, and one that undoubtedly slowed down Alexander's army, it was necessary. Philip's ban had worked because his men had been able to return home after each campaigning season to see their loved ones. Alexander's men could not. Nevertheless, even with this change, Alexander always prioritized having his army be as light as possible throughout his campaigns. For him, speed and mobility were key. Another equally important task of the Skoidos was distributing rations to the troops, most notably food and water. Grain products were the major staples of a Macedonian soldier's diet. Wheat, barley and millet – all were available throughout Asia and India. Not only were they easily portable, but once these products were dried, they could be stored indefinitely. From their ration, each soldier would use the grinding mills carried by the servants to create flour and, after that, make bread. It is also possible the Macedonians consumed grains in the form of biscuits and porridge. Yet the Macedonian soldiery did not live solely off grain products. Whenever possible, they would also eat dried meat, salted fish and shellfish to supplement their diet. Meat, however, was rare, and more often the soldiers turned to various kinds of dried fruit such as figs and dates, both readily available throughout much of Asia. Each Macedonian soldier would carry his food rations. While he was on campaign, these rations would usually be enough for 10 days. If Alexander wanted his troops to conduct a swift march, then the food each soldier would take with him was usually pre-cooked, mostly biscuits, fruit and if possible salted meat. <laughs>
This lightened the soldiers' pack, as cooking utensils were thus not required. Marching through Asia was undoubtedly hard work for a Macedonian soldier. Its consistently hot climate, countless deserts, and extensive barren lands would have been extremely taxing for any Macedonian burdened with arms, armour, and a heavy pack. Indeed, it appears armour was sometimes even discarded during these marches. Consequently, the requirement for sufficient calories and water was critical. Scholars assume that a minimum of three pounds of grain products, the equivalent of nearly one and a half kilograms of bread, as well as half a gallon of water, would be needed to supply each troop in these conditions daily, some 3,600 calories. Meanwhile, horses and mules needed eight gallons of water and ten pounds of both grain and straw a day if they were to be kept in good condition. As for a camel, although the animal could survive multiple days with barely any water, the animal was most efficient if the Macedonians gave it 10 gallons of water a day. It would also require 10 pounds of grain and 25 pounds of straw. Acquiring supplies would prove anything but easy. For most of his campaigning life, Alexander and his army traversed the various terrains of inland Asia lands on many occasions hostile to him, and far away from seas and navigable rivers. This forced Alexander to acquire supplies via land. Transporting supplies over land was fraught with difficulty. There were few carts and pack animals available in many of these regions, and there was also the constant threat of banditry. Furthermore, most agricultural societies in the east did not have a surplus of food from which they could help supply Alexander's passing army. But Alexander evidently found a solution. Recently, a groundbreaking study by Donald Engels concluded how the Macedonian king most likely achieved this. Upon his arrival in Mesopotamia after victory at Gorgamela, Alexander's power and military prestige in the east became phenomenal, and soon many of the remaining Persian officials surrendered. Alexander realized he could use this to solve his supply problem. He sent messengers ahead of his army to meet the officials to secure arrangements for the army's supply through their territory, sometimes taking hostages to ensure the officials kept their word. Thus, Alexander secured his supply lines far in advance. When officials did not surrender to Alexander, he took a different approach. He would acquire intelligence about the region, information such as its topography, routes, climate and resources, and he would then either launch a lightning campaign against the region with a small elite force keeping the main army back, or he would split his forces into smaller units that would gain supplies by either sacking settlements or foraging. These more destructive methods regularly occurred in the Persian heartlands. During the winter months, Alexander ensured his forces remained in a heavily settled, fertile area, usually adjacent to either navigable rivers or ports from where supplies could be more easily obtained. Thanks to his forward planning and charisma, Alexander was able to find solutions to the lingering threat of supply problems throughout his conquests. He had a plan for every scenario. There was, however, one occasion when this forward planning of provisions failed the Macedonian king. In 325 BC, Alexander marched his army across the Gedrosian Desert. It proved the greatest logistical error of his life costing thousands of lives. Some argue this devastating crossing occurred because of the man's pothos, his desire to outdo all before him, or out of revenge for his troops' earlier mutiny in India. Yet others believe Alexander simply made a mistake in his logistical planning. Alexander had expected his army to be supplied by the navy, commanded by Nearchus, as it made its way along the coast. Yet monsoon winds delayed the fleet from leaving the harbour in India for months. The result proved devastating for Alexander's men. Alexander and his army slowly withered as they crossed the desert. By the end, 75% of his force, mostly those in the baggage train, had perished. <laughs>
this was the exception in a campaign epitomized by many episodes of logistical brilliance. Alexander's campaign in both Asia and India required precise and advanced logistical planning, unlike any yet seen in antiquity. Its success was crucial to the survival of his campaign, a factor that is so often overlooked. We will cover other critical parts of Alexander's army in the next episode, so make sure that you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell icon to be notified of our videos. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and YouTube sponsors who make the creation of our videos possible. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.